Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of For the Love of Film, the series where I talk to other people who love film and we just generally discuss film related things because that's what we love to talk about and today I am joined by Matty Dudding. Uh, how about you introduce yourself and tell us what you do? Hi, yeah, yeah I'm Matthew. Um, so uh, kind of been starting out my film writing journey fairly recently to be honest. I've uh, mm. only really been doing it about a year, I suppose a year like kind of writing for other people. Um, mm. but obviously I've been into film for a long time and yeah just excited to be on and hoping to get more in to sort of this world of like you know film writing especially in like the UK mm. and stuff and it's a good little um like group of people and a nice little community and that so yeah just excited to get stuck in take it from there really so cool yeah cool uh because you've only been in this uh sort of film writing community slash um I don't know what you call it um area for only about a year or so would you say it's been uh, like daunting or has it been eye-opening or Definitely eye opening. I mean, super friendly. I found so I, I kind of um, came into it, you know, round about the pandemic, and I was mm. just, you know, what I'd, I've been on Twitter for years, um, like literally like ten years. But for for a long time, it was just me and like you know people I knew from home and mm. a couple of people I've met online and stuff. It's never really many film people, and I always used to tweet about films anyway. So I thought at around the time of the pandemic, where I think we're all craving like a little bit of you know. Yeah, human connection. I thought, you know what? I'm going to start following more people to uh, on film, and that's uh, mm. uh, just kind of got stuck in a bit more. Then, and yeah, everyone's really nice. Um, I think definitely around about the time of the London Film Festival, I got yeah. to meet a lot more people because you know there was like the, the group chats on there's like group chats, and you you meet people yeah. in person. You're like, oh my god, it's you! From, I know you from Twitter and stuff. Yeah, <laughs> super weird. But everyone's super really nice and. Um, you know, happy to give out advice. And I think it's a very, um, no one thinks that, you know, there's no like superiority or anything. You're like p people that have been there for years or people that have just started yeah. out, everyone's willing to help out and give you advice and be really honest about what it's like. And yeah, so mm. it's been great really. And anyone that's mm. wanting to, I don't know, get into that, I think just go for it and just start chatting to people online. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree with you because I've been doing <clears throat> that YouTube for good grief eight years now um but for a long period of time outside of like one or two people that i knew through youtube I, j I was just kind of on my own thing and it's only in the last year or so that i've got to start talking to more people and um really opening up to that that community and i think definitely like having that group chat which has got like 60 plus people in it's very daunting <laughs> yeah yeah it's crazy <laughs> um, yeah but it, it is quite nice because you can actually talk to like-minded people um and it, it's it's just really nice and i i totally agree with you everyone in there has been really lovely and supportive like no one is ever um oh, i can't think of the words no no one's ever um like uh rude or anything it's just really lovely supportive no matter what level you're at, I feel like you can get help. Yeah, definitely. And <laughs> I, just, some of it's yeah. lot, I wouldn't say easier than you'd think, but like, I don't mm. know what, when you, before you get into it, you, you assume that, oh, you know, you'd never be able to, you know, mm. get in a room with these people or go to like a, a press screening or a film yeah. festival, you know, pass and it seemed like impossible. Mm. And you get chatting to people and you just realize that everyone started just as a human that wanted to do the same thing. And sometimes it is literally just someone saying, yeah. oh, just send an email to this account. Mm. and just see what happens and sometimes it's like oh my god <laughs> yeah. I'm press accredited or I'm going to this you know press conference like it's so weird mm. and I think yeah if you know the, get into mm. with other people that are into it they can just give you like little tips and go yeah. away really yeah definitely um especially with someone like I I've mo like I said I've mostly been YouTube based but I've within the last like month or so started to try and veer into writing uh basically what you do already um and the amount of people from that group that have given me like some advice and tips has just been really helpful um because i already had a i already know roughly how to write but just that help just really does help you guide you guide you in the right direction if you don't quite know where to start and it's really yeah definitely. it's really beneficial um so on that point, and I thought this would be an interesting one to talk to, considering like I'm from a video based background, you're mm -hmm. um, into the writing. 
How exactly did you get into writing in about film specifically? Um, well, I mean, I've always enjoyed reading reviews. You know, I've always been into like film reviewers and you know, people I've watched on YouTube or like reading, you know, just reviews in general. Mm. So I think I've always been into it, but never really thought I could do it. Um, and then I, I got um, started um, a marketing career about, about mm. five years ago. Yeah. And when you're in marketing, you've kind of got to be have some copywriting skills. I mean, for mm. me, it started with just like social media posts, for like corporate accounts and stuff. Mm. And then you realize you've got to start doing a little bit of website copy or um, yeah. even like press releases. And so I was like, even though I was never like amazing at high school, I wasn't, I wasn't like top set English or anything. I was, you know, like, mm. I got a better B in the end. But um, I guess I realized that, oh, do you know what? I, could, I think I could do it. And I just started more from my work, started doing that. Mm. And then I think when I got letterbox as well, it was mm. kind of you had that from my um, my job, and then letterbox, which was like this site that just allowed you to you could write anything about a film, so you can mm. write you know a couple of sentences, you could write like a whole review, and I think mm. I just started like every now and then I'd see a film that I really love and just wanted to write something about, and um, I'd just have a go at it on letterbox, and it's not like high pressure, you know, there's no you're not getting paid or no, you know that can press yeah. anyone maybe you'll get a few likes on it um mm. it, maybe not but like you could sort of have a go at it from there so yeah i think once i started doing that when it got to around about last year and i was getting more into it i was like you know what i'm mm. just going to start right try and write more professionally mm. and um you know start reaching out to people obviously no i'm not going to get like paid to begin with or anything like that but i thought i'll look for sites or places that i can mm. start writing for and just start my journey from there so yeah that's kind of really started really um okay I've got a long way to go, I think, because, you know, I, I'm not like, I'm happy with some of the stuff I write, but I know there's lots of ways I can improve. So, yeah, um, but yeah, no, it's, yeah. Good. Yeah, no, that's, I, I like that comparison, because for anyone who's not done professional writing before, letterbox can be a good, like, tool to kind of get a bit of practice in. Um, and that being said, sometimes a one word joke review can get tons of likes <laughs> over yeah. like a, a detail yeah yeah it's pretty <laughs> yeah. annoying sometimes but at the same time mm. like it is what it is um but yeah. i do think you, you get some really good reviews on there as well that you read and you're like oh my god like that some mm. some of the writings are so good on there like mm. there's people on there that probably aren't even getting paid for it and are, you know writing some reviews that are maybe better than you'd read in mm. big publications so yeah you get lots of perspectives as well on films that you might not have necessarily seen before. And mm. yeah, I think anyone that wants to get into like film writing, I'd 100% be on Letterbox if you can and just mm. have a go at it and stuff. And, yeah. yeah, no, I totally agree. Sometimes um, <clears throat> if I've watched like a film recently and absolutely loved it, I like going on Letterboxd and just seeing reviews that other of the complete opposite just trying to see like what people thought and the way i mean some people can just hate on a film for the sake of it but then there are others yeah. that like you said they articulate it in a way that kind of makes you consider something you weren't initially thinking and it it, it really is eye-opening and it is it's quite a nice way and i think letterbox is probably one of the best film related sites to do that on now yeah definitely yeah, so you get the perspective on that you might not have seen, you know, people of mm. um, completely different backgrounds see yourself or mm. people that are into different films and they see something different to what you see. And mm. yeah, it's really interesting. Sometimes it annoys you because you're like, oh, damn it, I was really loved that film. Now I've seen like a negative that I didn't see before. And it's like, oh, yeah, um, that and, does happen. But it was like an old classic you've always loved and you go on mm. and you like some people really hate it and you're like, oh, man. Yeah. But that's that's life in it, I suppose. So, <laughs> yeah. Just out of curiosity, and I, again, it's, it'll probably be quite interesting considering like you're you're relatively new into that field. Um, is uh, is I wouldn't necessarily say is writing your job, or have you got like a main job on 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 the go? And this is your yeah, hobby? no, yes, yeah, it's more my hobby at the moment. Um, so again, I do digital marketing stuff. So again, I do bits mm. of writing, but not film related. Yeah, um, I think for me, the dream would be to do part of me thinks I'm almost better doing marketing within film so like yeah. my idea job would be do you know like um writers would go to a PR company for like yeah. a magazine or something or like a I don't know like a magazine and there's, there's a person somewhere in that magazine or that uh, website <coughs> that will be collating the reviews like yeah. messaging people can we get a review for this I'd love to be that person in a way because I think mm. 
that would give me the sort of flexibility. Maybe I could write every now and then, but I could, you know, mm. see other people's writing and yeah, I'd love to do that. Um, mm. so, but yeah, it's a hobby at the moment and okay. I still really enjoy it and yeah, keeps me okay. sane, I think. <laughs> um, so how specifically from a writing perspective or just generally if you're just doing a review on letterboxd or anything how do you approach film criticism like what elements specifically do you go out of your way to look for in a film or does it kind of depend on the film that you're watching well i definitely i think i try to keep always try to keep an open mind to begin with Mm. um i always like to think that i'm not particularly favored of one job well there's definitely genres i gravitate more towards but I like to be able to think I could go into any film, no matter the genre, and you yeah. know, go in with a, a level ground and be like, right, doesn't matter if it's a musical or whether it's a horror, I can mm. try and appreciate it for what it is. Yeah. Um, and I think I try to stop, I, I know when I've had it in the past where you, you'll do a, a review for a film or you'll see a film, it's very easy to get kind of tunnel vision on something. So you yeah. might find a particular aspect of a film that maybe you love, and mm. you find yourself writing and reviewing, you've done like, I don't know, three paragraphs on one point and there's loads of other things coming like, oh, no, I need to try mm. and stop doing that. So I try to look at it as a whole. And mm. again, I, I'm I'm really big into like the film production side of it. So, mm. I'm, you know, new music in particular, I love film music, um, yeah. like film soundtracks. So that's definitely something that can really elevate a film for me. Mm. Um, yeah, cinematography. Mm. I, I think those are things that I didn't necessarily focus on when I was younger and then... Mm. You know, as is often the case, the more films you see, the more you sort of learn mm. to appreciate um, those elements. Mm. Um, and I guess as well, I always try to consider the genre. I guess, you know, when you um, say yeah. it's like a horror film, it, I don't want to judge it. I, you know, you try to judge it on its own merit, but there's definitely yeah. a, an element of you kind of comparing it to other films and seeing, mm. is it a totally original? If not, then what's it similar to? And is it better than those? Um, yeah. I think that's kind of a subconscious thing sometimes because you know if you've seen so many films you tend to be like oh this reminds me of this film or mm. whatnot um yeah. and I I don't know like the last year as well since I've got into writing I've tried to note stuff down okay so I, I've got like a little film journal thing that I've got now where I'll yeah as soon as it's fresh in my mind when I get home I'll try and write out some like notes and stuff I did mm. actually t- try to write them in the cinema because yeah. I saw when I was down at LFF some people doing that but Sometimes mm. you're so dark in the cinema, I'll come out and they'll be just scribbled everywhere. I was like, I can't even read it. So, you know, wait till I get I, <laughs> I've, I've never understood how people can write notes watching a film in the cinema. Like, mm. I, to me, I'd just be like, no, my brain's too busy watching the film. I'm yeah. just going to end up doing a crossword by accident in the book. And I, I've never understand how people can do that. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm on board with you on that one. I just wait till I get home. And just kind of go right. This is what I thought of the film, the Lilla, and that's probably the easiest yeah. way to do it than trying to write it in the dark. Um, yeah, no, it's yeah. <laughs> I've, I've had it before. <laughs> it just, I think there was Babylon was the last one I attempted to, mm. and there was just scribbles everywhere. I was like, oh my god, like it's like almost dis- indecipherable. So I'm just like, you know what, forget it. I'll just start doing the yeah. the film now. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you can write a film in Morse code, then I feel like that. <laughs> that yeah, yeah, a, yeah, yeah, just good tap it along in the film. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on, a, on a similar note then, to, in terms of um, well, just film in general and how you approach it, what's the most recent film you've seen that you uh, absolutely loved? It can be an old film or a recent film, just the most recent <clears throat> thing. Um, yeah, you know what? I've, this year, 2023, I still don't think I've seen one I would consider like a five star banger yet mm. for me. Um, yeah, there's been some good ones I've enjoyed, like Marcel and mm. mentioned Babylon earlier and uh, Pearl, but there's not been one yeah. that's really blown me away this year yet. So I guess the last one, I know I rewatched Decision to Leave just before mm. I'd, I'd seen it at LFF and then reviewed yeah. it and then wanted to watch it again. So I think I got it on movie. Mm. um just to, like before we, uh, after yeah the christmas holidays and stuff and yeah mm. that one again so i think that one actually grew on i mean i liked it the first mm. time but i think it grew on me even more mm. um yeah part and walk the way he just did, like puts it all together and i think the editing in that film really impresses me like yeah it all just flows so naturally and i mean he's always uh, his films are always really well edited i can't remember his name now but um mm. yeah so that's that's definitely one of them that's really blown me away um, 
in terms of old watches, it wasn't super old. It was only a few years ago. But I watched mm. Carol for the first time. Maybe it was okay. I still haven't January. seen that. I really loved that. Mm. Absolutely loved it. Um, again, it's one of those ones where you, you go in a little in trip, yeah. trepidatious because it's got you really well liked and stuff. Mm. But yeah, as soon as it started, I was like into it, and yeah, really loved that one. So yeah, if you're not seen it, I would definitely recommend it. Yeah, I need to get into Carol because <clears throat> I think. Um... Oh god, I can't remember the director's name, but I know pretty much all of his work is like a a grey area that I need to get into. But I can't bloody remember his name. Todd yeah, Haynes. I've... Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, yeah. yeah I knew it was Todd. <laughs> I I mean, it, it was yeah. Todd something. <laughs> yeah. Um. But yeah, I I I, I agree with you as well with decision to leave because I saw that as well back in um, LFF, and I do need to give it a rewatch because I think when I first saw it it took me like a full month to fully kind of get it and appreciate it. Yeah, it's very, I feel like the, nar- the narrative is very, um, how would you describe it? You've got to take like a lot of the stuff that happens almost not on face value. I, mm. I think a lot of it's like very like metaphorical. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that yeah. sounds really cringy to say, but like a lot of it, it like the relationship mm. near the end of the film, which I don't want to spoil, but mm. a lot of it is, kind of to do with, like the metaphors behind it as a much like you, you almost got to like mm. not yeah take not too full mm. much on face value and i think then so when i watched it the second time yeah i could kind of appreciate that more rather the first time i did think as much as i loved it there was the, that little bit that was like oh yeah it was a bit bit some weird bits near the end but yeah, yeah. i definitely think it's growing on me and yeah it's definitely a film that is a lot more fantastical than i was expecting it to be because the only Park Chan work film I've seen, uh, I'm going to admit this now, is Old Boy. I've not seen okay. The Handmaiden or stuff like that. So yeah. I went in kind of expecting like a, a police procedural crime sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> and like you said, like the whole second half, just kind of, you kind of have to suspend disbelief in a good way and kind of take reality out of it and make it work in your head yeah yeah i think some people would definitely be like sadly like well that won't happen and but you mm. was, i think yeah. with certain films you just kind of have to roll with it and yeah that's i think that's one of them but yeah and no, i really enjoyed it yeah uh, i do need to rewatch that um but yeah carol's been on my list for way too long <laughs> and i need to fix that yeah yeah it was the same with me as well um it's just some of those films you just have sometimes where you hmm I'll watch it, I'll watch it at some point, and oh, yeah, yeah. sometimes you just one of those ones where you, de- Actually, Carol's not too bad, but there's, there's always films where you'll be in discussion with like other film people, and you'll just be kind of mm. quiet, because you're like, I've not seen it, <laughs> you're like embarrassed to admit you've not seen it, so you just like, just don't mm. say anything. <laughs> yeah, I had that last year, funnily enough, coming out of Decision to Leave, and I was like, I've not seen The Handmaiden, and everyone mm. kind of turned to me and was like, yeah. what? <laughs> Um, so that was a bit like, oops, sorry guys. Um, yeah. But yeah, I'll, I'll, I do like pan, pa, pan chan work, park chan work. God, I'm, I'm working. <laughs> I'm, I'm working off of uh, a little less, a little less sleep than usual. So yeah. getting words muddled up. <laughs> uh, anyway, so in terms going back to your uh, writing career again, you've only been doing it for a short time. <clears throat> but what would you say necessarily has been the biggest? highlight whether that be a review uh, an article you've done or an opportunity that's arisen because of what you've previously written yeah um i think there's two that kind of spring to mind one was mm. kind of before i was doing like fully film so mm. uh the marketing i do is for like a, a college mm. and one day just by pure chance i noticed that someone on twitter was interacting with um francis lee he, so he directed the name um, rings a bell, yeah. God's Own Country and Ammonite, which was the most recent yeah. one. Yeah. And I found out that he actually went to the college I work at. Okay. Like like thirty years ago or something. Oh blimey. And just just thought, you know what? Mm. This is a, we always do case studies for the college, so it's like a big part mm. of the job. But also I thought for my own like selfish needs, I'm like, you know what, that'd be really cool to interview a direct. So I yeah. just I, I got a hold of his agent and just asked if he, you know, I was on mm. working for the college and would he be interested in doing like a case study. And okay. Next thing I knew, I was like in a video call with him for about like 20 minutes, just <laughs> chatting about the college and oh, blimey. film. So that was really surreal. Um, I guess that's probably one of the reasons mm. I ended up wanting to do more on film anyway, because that was like, oh yeah. my God, so you can, you can do it. And um, mm. so that was definitely one of them. Um, 
And then, yeah, I think LFF, the whole LFF experience mm. um, was amazing. Um, you know, be able to write stuff and the first press screening was like, it was, it was, my first one was after Sun, so it was like a really, yeah. wow, okay, <laughs> set the bar for you high year. Um, and then yeah. I ended up, there was the um, the Glass Onion press conference, which again, in mm. my head, I, I imagine you had to do these, jump through loops and do all sorts to get in. And I just yeah. dropped someone a message at the, um, you know, the thing that was, what do I have to do to get there? Yeah. Is it easy? I just said, oh yeah, just reply to the email. So I replied in oh. the next minute, we were queuing up and in a room mm. with like, you know, Daniel Craig and Ryan Johnson, it was super surreal and mm. didn't have the nerve to ask him anything. Um, yeah. But uh, I don't know if you know Ayush, he's... Um, yeah, he's I saw the video there. he took of... So I, I filmed conference. him asking a question to, was it yeah. Kate Hudson, I think? And I was yeah. just sat there like shaking, like... <laughs> <laughs> so that that was a really weird one as well like that was yeah proper like what the heck is going on here um so, yeah, so i think those two moments mm. that again um stand out to me and yeah again i can't wait to hopefully go you know okay. film festival um next year and hopefully do some other film festivals as well and mm. a really good atmosphere and just great to be around other like film obsessives mm. Yeah, no, that sounds really cool. Um, I do, I do think the festival because I've done, I've done LFF since twenty eighteen, but last year was the first time I did it as a member of the press, and it was yeah, again kind of carrying over what we said earlier. It was nice actually getting to meet those people that you've been talking to for like a several months in person, um, and getting to kind of bounce opinions back and forth, and again like help and advice and tips and stuff like that, um. But funnily enough, one of the things was that I I, I was slightly annoyed missing that press conference because I didn't see Glass Onion at the festival because um, right. that was one of the days I couldn't do, um, and I was just really annoyed that like most people, <laughs> like everyone that I knew was at that press conference. I was like, God damn it! <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it was that's the problem with the festival. I mean, uh, where about how far out of London do you live? Are you quite? So I live in near Hastings or okay, in yeah. southeast uh, England. So it's about God, like an hour and a half on the train. Right. So you're similar to me in that. I mean, yeah. when I I had to because obviously I live up north. I had to mm. before the um uh you know well the festival had been announced. I think some of the lineup had come out, but I had to just kind of wing it and be like, right, I'm just going to yeah. this week and just pray mm. that some of the films uh, are mm. okay that when I go. Um, thing is you know like the um the transport in the uk is just so expensive so you, mm. if, like, if i can't afford to basically just book the train the day of you know mm. cause it costs like, like yeah it's, it's ridiculous <laughs> yeah so i had to book a hotel i had to mm. book um train down and just by luck i think because i booked it to the end of the festival because someone had mm. told me that um they tend to do the really big films mm. um near the end like the final week yeah so i was like right if i do um I think I went for a week, so I saw some of the big films near the end, like Last Sunday, and, yeah. and and then got to see some of the smaller ones mm. near the beginning. So, yeah, it's, it, it's a good in, in my. I think for, was it'd be great just to go the entire thing and see everything. Oh yeah, um, but I know I don't know about you. I was like pretty exhausted by the end of it, and I was, <laughs> I was like, right, I think I just stopped watching as many films when I got back home for a little bit. Because like, right, I need a, a bit of a break. I think. <laughs> bit of a breather yeah i yeah. didn't i didn't do as many days as i wanted to last year um <clears throat> just because life and also my birthday fall, fell right on the last day of the festival and it was like okay yeah it's my birthday but it's really inconvenient um <laughs> so i because i'd never like done a, a the, the festival before like for a good length i didn't quite know what to do so i just basically did it so that like right i'm going on this day this day and this day and then i kind of got the train up that morning saw a couple films then went back but i think i know from experience that this year i'm gonna just stay up there for a chunk because that's yeah. probably the better thing to do because one what i did was just not cost effective and two it's just a lot easier um but i think it would also be better because i know last year's lineup was really weird because they lumped it pretty much 90% of the films in like the first week and then the second week was empty yeah which was definitely a, a problem for me in that again I said the, the big films near the end but yeah. like you say that it was just one a day mm. rather um 
you know, when I first went, it was great because there was for that first Ooh. few days I could see like you know three films a day, mm. um, like a really big selection. So I, I am a little gutted that I didn't see some of the smaller ones. And yeah, um, I think now knowing what I know, next time I'll, I'll maybe try and go down mm. earlier because I think mm. in a way that the smaller films are better to review because you know when you're putting it mm. out later on, there's less comp. I'm gonna say less competition, but every, you know every man and his dog wanted to review. Like something like Glass Onion and whatever, and there's oh, yeah. you know, hundreds of reviews out there. Mm. Rather, if you try and review a smaller film that not as many people, it's almost a better way to get your name seen and stuff, and your review yeah. seen. So, no, I totally I agree. see what I do next year. And yeah, I I was kind of gutted because there were films like Bones and All and After Sun and I can't think of another one, but there there were all these really great indie films that I'd heard really good things about from like Cannes and Sundance that were all in the first <laughs> week and I was like I've I've missed almost all of them and what I ended up seeing in the second week wasn't I wouldn't necessarily call it the scraps but like I would have rather have seen more films at the start um, yeah 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 totally. than, than what we got at the end especially considering my first film in person last year was The Sun and that was like a massive disappointment <laughs> You know, I've still not seen that. I, I remember people in the chat mm. uh, after that they'd come out. I don't know why I saw that day. I don't know if that was the day. I think I maybe went to see One Fine Morning. Um, mm. Was it something else? I don't know. But I remember everyone coming out and like messaging and be like, people were as yeah. bothered about that one. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, that was because I was like, okay, it's my first day in person. I'd seen a couple online already and I was like, okay, it's my first day in person. This is going to be great. And then I see the sun at the first thing in the morning and I'm like, Oh god, <laughs> this is not going well. Yeah, yeah, I think I cleansed the palette with decision to leave on that day, which was a nice like um, one to kind of take my <clears> mind <throat> off the sun. But yeah. that was not a good film, <laughs> film to start with. <laughs> so this is a question that I ask everyone on this series, um, purely just out of curiosity, because I like seeing what different people's responses are. But do you remember, if you can, what was the first? film that you remember that really sparked your love for cinema in the first place um there's definitely a few so i mean i was born in 95 so any mm. a lot of the films that were like big franchises like the early yeah you know, the, the 90s or the early 2000s like they got me really going so a lot of the rings trilogy i mean i feel like everyone mm. every, every lad at my school was like obsessed with lord of the rings so and, yeah you know, they had the behind the scenes footage and it was just oh, it's so exciting. Mm. Um, so definitely a lot of the rings. Um, mm. I always said that one of the big ones was Jurassic Park, which I'd seen way too young. And again, that was another one where I'd like, you knew all the behind the scenes stuff and I was just like obsessed with it. Um, yeah. Star Wars, Star Wars is like always been a big mm. one. Um, again, my dad was always into Star Wars and mm. regardless of what you think of the prequel trilogy, you know, I was like growing up when the prequels were out, so there was like a big excitement around Star Wars oh, yeah. at the time. Um, I remember seeing like Revenge of the Sith in cinemas and mm. um, yeah, so I've always loved Star Wars and again, the, especially the original trilogy, um, mm. watch them back and yeah, it still gets me like infused. So yeah. yeah, those are kind of the big ones. And then I think as I, you know, got older, there's different films. Um, I remember mm. like seeing the Alien series mm. quite young again and like loving mm. those. Um, I would say like Aliens was like that for probably the most memorable um, watching a film on TV ever. Me and my dad yeah. sat down uh, one evening. It was like on probably like film four or something. Yeah. And uh, it got to maybe like um, midway through the film and my dad was like, I, I can't remember, I must have been like 10, 11, again, probably too young, but he'd be like, yeah. right now, I can't watch anymore. We, we need to go to bed. It's like, it's getting like half 10 now. Mm. And then something like you know like the, the second half of that film was just Ooh. so exciting every time it get to like the next adverts we're like all right we'll, we'll watch it to the next set of adverts because you just get <laughs> and then end up watching the whole thing and like i remember coming off yeah. like my mind after that film was like oh my god that was just so good mm. um, so yeah like films throughout like my life kind of got me more into it over time and mm. um, yeah but definitely all those kind of classic uh, like Jurassic park and lord of the rings when i was younger was i think Ooh. sparked that kind of love when i was a kid Okay, no, that's there's some there's some very good choices there, um, and kind of on a similar note, kind of what you were saying anyway, would you say your taste in film generally has kind of developed and evolved over the uh, evolved over the years? Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
I mean, it's all about. I think the more you see, the the more mm. you, you start to you know appreciate different things. Um, I know mm. for me, like when I was young, it was probably all about the story and like how um, how mm. I felt about the story and the characters. Because I think like um, things like writing it carries over from literature and yeah. and games and and mm. TV. So it's like something that I think everyone can kind of appreciate. Mm. But like you know, as you, the more you watch films, you start to learn more about like how cinematography works mm. um and you know the production design that goes behind making a film um mm. i think for me one thing that i've definitely appreciated more since i've gotten older is yeah a film's mood so like particularly when i started getting more into horror um yeah like one of my favorite directors of all time is john carpenter and i just think oh, yeah if you ever watch a john carpenter film the story is sometimes irrelevant you just know instantly that it's a john carpenter film just by the way it, it captures the yeah. mood it's in photography with like dean cundy and his yeah. soundtracks i was um, gonna say the soundtrack is usually <laughs> yeah. like uh especially i think the first time i watched they live for the first time i was like yeah this is a john carpenter john carpenter <laughs> you know straight got, away <laughs> yeah the synths the the font just everything like just that hits you in the first five minutes you're like yeah this is a john carpenter film. yeah yeah so I think like films like that where I might not have like been as obsessed as a kid. So I think I'd have been like, oh, the story doesn't make me feel like, like mm. major emotions. But now like I just love a film that like you know babes me in like an atmosphere. Yeah, no, I I totally I totally agree. <laughs> I think for me, back when I was slightly younger, it was more about like the visuals of a film, and like if they don't grab me instantly, then it could kind of turn me off. But I, I kind of agree with you. There are film I've I've grown more um fond and I've have become more fascinated with not necessarily like John Carpenter films, but like small low key dramas that just rely solely on a specific feel, like the before films or um what's another one? There is another good example. Uh, most of Mia Lo- Mia Hansen loves films where it, where it's just like there's not much plot and there's yeah, not it's, it's the, mostly just the characters and the moment the vibe and, the and that yeah 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 hundred um, percent um, I mean one that always springs to mind for me is like Lost in Translation where yeah again it's not the most like gra- there's no like grand um, you know the, the two characters there's no big romantic moments or there's no mm. like huge plot developments it's all kind of about that sort of dreamy yeah. feel of everything and. Yeah, I don't think my younger self would have liked films like that or like say something from Mia Hansen mm. at all. But now I can like totally appreciate that, and it's definitely something I think you get the more you watch more films. Oh, yeah. And kind of, yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, I I, t- I totally agree with that. Um, and you also get like a different and more you get more appreciative of different genres as well. I find because when I was a kid slash teenager. I didn't watch many horror films, whereas nowadays I, again, I don't watch many, but I, I am more open to trying that. Or the same with foreign language films. I'm yeah. more open to trying that because I've seen more. Yeah, um, yeah. Same with horror as well. Uh, I, I don't mm. know if it was just because I was, I think part, some of it, I was like fascinated with them, but scared stiff of them. So like I used yeah, to, same. <laughs> I used to sometimes Google like the plot synopsis, of, mm. like some of them, because I was too scared to watch them, but I wanted to know about them a little bit. Mm. Um, and then I think just later on, I, I just watched some scary ones. I'm like, oh, do you know what? I think I can handle these better than I thought I could. Yeah. And then you see other ones, and you're like, oh no, I actually really like these. And yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. Or something grew over time. I I feel like there's a specific thing with horror, just on its own, where like it's more like especially as a teenager or kid. It's more fascinating and can also be quite daunting, especially with the classics, because they've got such a reputation like The Exorcist or Texas Chainsaw Massacre or the original Alien, where it's like they're so renowned for being as scary as they are. It can be quite daunting, especially when you're getting into that genre for the first time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I say if you're remotely scared of them, I mean, every time I saw like people talk about the exorcist i was like shit scared of watching it just because of you know the things yeah. you hear about it and stuff um but now yeah now there's not much i think the only ones i wouldn't dive into are just something like the real like um some of the real video nasties that i'm always a bit like mm. scared of watching i once uh out of curiosity watched a little bit online of um cannibal holocaust like the final oh God. And i watched a tiny <laughs> bit and i was like 
whoa, no way, no way. And I like crossed it off, and then that was it. So I've, I've, every t- same with like, um, I was really scared of watching Martyrs because I hear so mm. much about it, and mm. I'm just like scared of being disturbed. I think. <laughs> so yeah, I've, I think those are the ones where I'm like still a little bit like anxious of watching. I don't know if I mm. would, but maybe. I think, I think the only. I don't even know if it, you could really call it video nasty anymore because it's, it's quite well tame in comparison. But like the only ones I've really delved into is the Evil Dead and the original Texas Chainsaw because, especially Texas Chainsaw, if you look at that now, it's relatively it's tame. Like it doesn't even really deserve the eighteen rating. In no, my it's opinion. not gory at all, is it? I mean, it is no. scary, and I do mm. think some of like say grimy and nasty about it, but mm. it's yeah, more yeah, intense like, say... than anything. Yeah, 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 yeah. And like you said, there's really, there's basically no gore, really. Um, mm. It's like that with a lot of the classics, though. Again, Halloween's one of my favourite, and mm. I think people in the mind envision it being really violent, but there's, you know, there's barely a drop of blood in that film. And, yeah, and it's that is a good point. Different methods, isn't it? So, yeah. Um, Evil Dead's a little bit like, there's some bits in the original one. That's, there's the bit with it, is it the pencil? It sticks the pencil oh, on like, the heel, and I'm like, oh! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I think the bit I was it I oh it's hard to say enjoying the Evil Dead considering the like the gruesome stuff in it, but I think I was fine with it up until the bit with the tree, where it just mm, yeah. attacks that woman, and I was just like bloody hell, this is a bit much, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I think is it Sam Raimi's talked about that saying he he sort of regretted doing <clears throat> that. Um, it yeah. works, then they still put it in. Kind of put it in the 2013 one. Um, I again, still I haven't seen I love the 2013 that. one. I, I really love the 2013 one, but mm. they do include bits of the tree stuff in it yeah. again. And I was like, do we need to do that again? Like, I'm not really sure. Um, <laughs> We've done it once. One, we don't need to see yeah. it again. <laughs> yeah, that one's way gorier though. That one's mm. that was really like full on. Um, not in like a disturbing way. They're more in like a whoa, what the hell? Like sort of thing. Yeah. So. <laughs> I think I think I've been slightly put off watching the 2013 one because of that one bit with the knife and the tongue. Because that bit, right, just, yeah. I've seen like snippets of it, and I'm just like, mm, nah, that, nah, nah, I'm not into <laughs> that. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's 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 pretty intense. I I'd, I'd still recommend it, but yeah, mm. it's yeah, pretty crazy. <laughs> okay, going from some really good films uh, to the complete other end of the spectrum, and again, I love asking this question because. I, I like seeing what people's answers are and <laughs> I like to I like to keep this channel res- relatively positive in terms of like what I talk, I only talk about films on this YouTube channel about that I genuinely like or want people to go out of their way to watch that being said what is the worst film you've ever seen if you could possibly choose from an array of awfulness <clears throat> yeah um see the ones I'm tempted to pick really are more with the bad, but also ones that made me angry a little bit. Mm. I think the one that sticks out to me, it probably isn't the worst film I've ever seen, really. Yeah, but it's the one where I came out of the cinema most annoyed was probably the 2018 Predator film, the Shane Black oh, one. Yeah, that Predator. was terrible. Um, yeah, I, I remember being so annoyed when I came out of that film. Mm. Um, again, I've the, the original Predator is one of my favorites of all time, mm. uh, and I even like some of the other earlier entries. Like, I even quite enjoy the Predators, which was the 2010 11 one. Yeah, that's I the one that... with Adrian Brody in it, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's not perfect, but it's all right. No. But the the 2018 one, oh man, it was just all no. over the place. Yeah, um, it was like the weird bits where they <coughs> use like, we need the kid to be able to read any language. So, oh yeah, he's, he's autistic, then that's how he yeah. can read. Like <laughs> that that annoyed me the most because like I'm on the spectrum, and that I I I especially in recent years I've become fascinated with how films approach that um and for the most i went into the predator just expecting a predator film so the fact that they just throw that in there i'm like what are you doing and why yeah. are you doing this <laughs> it was such poor taste and then there's that i mean i won't want to spoil it but there's the final sequence it's kind of like almost not quite a post credit sequence but it's like the end bit oh, i mean if that I mean, had been earlier yeah. in the film i think mm. i would have walked out because like the rest of the film was stupid but that yeah. bit at the end mm. i was like wow just, yeah. um, I think it annoyed me as well because again, Shane Black, uh, he'd, he'd done you know the mm. Nice Guys, which I really love. That was literally just two years before that. I know. So, so he's obviously yeah. good at doing you know writing good dialogue mm. and doing something you know quite humorous. And then mm. I don't know what happened, but I'm glad Prey came out 
last year because I think I was oh, like yeah. ready to give up with the Predator <laughs> series in general. Um, yeah. But yeah, that, so that that's probably the one that like I think annoyed me most. Yeah. Um, again, it's probably ones I've seen that are worse, but yeah, that one comes I, to mind, I think. I, to be honest, I completely back that. I mean, I completely forgot about it until you mentioned it because I, I just part yeah, of my brain had just kind of yeah. blocked it out. <laughs> um, but yeah, that film is—I forgot how dreadful that was. And again, it, I think I, I agree with you. It it was even more disappointing considering pretty much everything Shane Black had done before that was either good or great, and then he just comes out with the Predator, and it just feels half-assed in every single way. And it, yeah, it, yeah, you've 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 opened up like some Vietnam PTSD <laughs> for me on that one. <laughs> and I think you just didn't learn the lesson as well that attempting to do that like eighties action bravado just doesn't yeah. work anymore. Like there was, no. there's something weird about the eighties where you could get away with it in the eighties, mm. and it, it's amazing. Like again, I watched the original Predator, and you know, Arnie's throwing one liners, and it's it, oh, it's brilliant. But like trying yeah. that that kind of thing now, I just it just don't work and. I think that's what I love about Prey, that it decided, right, let's scrap the bravado and the yeah. the one-liners. Let's just go for, like, a stripped-back kind of slasher-like mm. horror and just run with it. So, yeah, but, yeah, um, yeah, I remember walking out of that and just being like, oh, man. <laughs> uh, I'm so glad Prey exists because it just kind of cleanses the palate and makes you forget about what happened about, like, three years before. <laughs> before yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so, uh, the... The, the final big question that I like to ask everyone as well, and again, this is one that I like seeing what people say, because I feel like this is a question that was open to varying different uh, answers, is that if you were stranded on a desert island and you could only choose five films to take with you, what are you choosing? Yeah, so this one's a really tough one. Um, mm. It would be easy for me to just be like, oh, you know what, just pick the top five films, my favourite yeah. films. But I feel like if I was on like a desert island, I'd want to kind of have that sort of the spectrum of different genres mm. and stuff. Yeah. So with that in mind, I guess I'd try and pick like a mixture. So I think you've got to have a comedy in there. Oh, so yeah. it makes me laugh. Um, for me, I don't think there's a funnier film than The Big Lebowski. Mm, um, okay. I just, it's just so funny every time I watch it and not just every time I watch it, sometimes I'll just even see clips on like YouTube or TikTok and yeah. it, it never fails to make me laugh. Um, the, the, the line deliveries from like John Goodman, just, just so good. Um, I also love about that film as well, that um, the dude's attitude to everything is just such a great mantra to live by. Yeah. Like the amount of things that happened to him in that film and he just kind mm. of goes about the whole... <laughs> It, you know, life goes on. Yeah. I can't worry about that. Shit. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I think if you're on a desert island, that kind of attitude, mm. like you need that to sort of keep you level and just be like, well, I can't do anything now. So yeah, stop it. That, that's um, fair enough. Yeah. Um, so comedy. Um, mm -hmm. I think I'd have to do a horror. Um, mm. Even though Halloween is my favorite, I feel like for me the big appeal of Halloween is watching it um, with like the candles on on on. Yeah, 31st and what the whole atmosphere you wouldn't have that there. Oh, yeah, so I guess I'd have to go probably with Scream. Okay, um, for me, it's like the most rewatchable horror film, I can just watch it pretty much any time. Mm. It's always entertaining. Obviously, I'd be alone in Ireland, but like if you ever watch Scream with someone that hasn't seen it before, yeah, it's just absolutely brilliant. Like just seeing the reactions to everything. Mm. Um, yeah, so it's so entertaining, it's really funny. Um, yeah. I still think that that opening's like maybe the best opening of at least any horror film I can think of. Mm. Um, yeah, and this is the original one, of course. Um, yeah. I do like. The I, sequel. I was going to ask. Like, I presume mm. he's talking about the original, and not. Yeah, the yeah. I mean, to be I do love a lot of the sequels. Um, mm. I think it's quite a a relatively solid franchise. Mm. Um, but the first one's just you know leaps and bounds over the rest of them. Oh um, yeah. Also, I think because it's so <clears throat> referential of different horror films, I also, it's like a film I can mm. live. The horror films that I couldn't see, you know, because I've only got five yeah. films. I could live the other horror films through Scream. Yeah, no, um, I get that. Yeah, that, that one. Um, so we've done a comedy mm. horror. I'd have to do probably like a romance, a romance, a romantic yeah. film. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm definitely big on like kind of weirder ones. So okay. the one that's coming sticking out for me is probably Punch Drunk Love. Okay. Um, yeah. Good choice. Yep. Um. I just love how Barry Egan is like the most unconventional, like you know, romantic lead ever. Really, he's so yeah. awkward and socially anxious, 
and mm. I definitely feel like I can relate to some of that. Um, mm. I don't know if I go punching up a bathroom, but like I definitely <laughs> can relate to some of these, you know, anxieties and stuff. Yeah. Um, and I just oh, there's something about that film where mm. um, I think it's some of the music makes a difference to it, but like it feels really romantic without having to go over the top with like. There's like yeah. a sequence later on with the He Needs Me where they have the embrace at the in Hawaii. Yeah. And that film makes me feel like like romancing like more than mm. a lot of other films do. So yeah. yeah, it'd have to be that one. That yeah, I I like that choice. That's it's not a conventional one, but like it it it, it gets the whole romance thing across really nicely, like you said, without needing to do much. It just kind of is there. <laughs> it's not yeah. a massive thing until it needs to be. And I think I, I I don't think it's one of my favorite Paul Thomas Anderson films, but it keeps like I out of all the films I've seen of his, it just kind of stays in my head a bit more than the others. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, he's probably my favorite one, but mm. you know, he's, he's I mean, what a filmography he's got. Um, I mean, you could you can choose like Phantom Thread as another mm. really effed up um, <laughs> romantic <laughs> film to put up on on the list there as well. Mm. So um, yeah, so that to be that one. Mm. Um. I can't not because I'm just a Ghibli obsessive. I couldn't not put a Ghibli film. Oh, go on. It was one? tempting to put Mononoke up there because it's probably mm. my favourite. But for me, I think the most rewatchable is actually Ponyo. Okay. Um, it's a bit of a weird choice because I know mm. people tend to like rank it lower down in, especially Miyazaki's filmography. Yeah. But I don't know. I just love it. Um, it's like the happiest film ever. Mm. It's just so uncynical and it's really lovely it's, it's definitely weird i mean you've yeah. got to the first few times well definitely the first time i was like so this is like a romance between a five-year-old boy and like a fish girl <laughs> it's like what the heck <laughs> it's but, like the reverse of the shape of water <laughs> yeah yeah but i generally think when you watch it again and you just kind of mm. just forget that and just bathe in like the, the you know the the atmosphere of it yeah the location is just so beautiful the sense mm. of place joe hisashi's music's just always so nice and mm. Yeah, I, I, even though it's, I won't quite say it's my favorite Ghibli. I think it's the one I rewatch the most because again, okay. it doesn't require much of the viewer either. You can kind of just mm. you don't have to think too hard about the plot. You can just kind of sit back and yeah, it transports me away. And yeah, it's really lovely. To, so to, to be honest, I feel like choosing any Ghibli film is a safe, like really secure bet. If, if it's My Neighbor Totoro, Spirited Away, Princess Mononoke, like you said, I feel like if you choose any of them. You're pretty good. Yeah, you can't go wrong, can you? <laughs> nah. <laughs> yeah, such a good set of films. So, yeah, mm. I'll have to put that one. Cool. Uh, and then the final one, <clears throat> I guess I'd have to go with something like really big. Because um, mm. I feel like all the films have been quite small scale. Um, yeah. So, I think I'd probably go Blade Runner 2049. Um, nice, nice choice. <laughs> Just like the scope of it, it's just so massive. Mm. The themes it's tackling, and you know about like existence and humanity mm. and everything, just so big. Yeah. Um. I mean, the scale of it as well. I mean, I know. I, yeah. I, if there was one film I could watch on IMAX again, mm. I'd, I'd pick that one in a heartbeat. Um, yeah. It works for me every time as well. Like I always feel like moved by it in the end, and it just blows me away. Some of the sequences, the, the, especially the bit at the end in the um the seawall sequence where. I won't mm. spoil it, but you know, it's like the, the yeah. rain and the in the what. Oh man, it's, when it, when that gets going, I just I'm like, wow, like this is just it's just unbelievable. Mm. Um, yeah, and I think yeah, that balance out this, you know, gave me something a bit bigger in scope and transport mm. me away. And yeah, so I guess that would be my five. Yeah, no, I think you got a nice selection there. You've got something that caters not just every genre, but kind of most moods that you might want to be in. Um, and I feel. <clears throat> Uh, if you were in that predicament, it would be nice to go from something small scale like Punch Drunk Love and then go in for something really grand and epic um, yeah. like Blade Runner 2049. Um, but no, that's, there's some really solid picks. And I, t I agree with you as well. Like I, I would give anything to rewatch Blade Runner 2049 on the big screen again because it was just one of those films where it's just so immersive in how huge it is it just kind of washes over you and you can't take everything in all at once on that first viewing because it is oh, just no, definitely so, not because it's so grand yeah um, but it was definitely one that grew over me and like I, I remember seeing it um the first time I, I did like it yeah um but again it's probably the same as the original Blade Runner for me it was over mm. re-watching it and thinking about it and I mean just some of the sequences alone mm. uh, you know I, I could just watch them back and 
Mm. There's, like, there's the bit where um, uh, Kian Love, you know, the, 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 he takes her out outside that first time with that, um, yeah. whatever it, I forgot it was called, and it's like raining and there's that balcony. Mm. And like that sequence alone, it's just like mesmerizing. Uh, mm. Again, so I used to, if you think about sequences like that all yeah. the time, I was like, oh no, I, I really do love this film. Um, mm. So yeah, I, I want to see it again and mm. maybe someday they'll put it back on IMAX. Yeah, fingers crossed. I, I do love that film quite a bit, but I always have trouble um, choosing a favourite between that and the original because I feel like they work for slightly different reasons. Like, the second one is uh, brilliant for its scope alone, but it, obviously it has other things working in its favour. But then the first one has got like a really intriguing plot, it's got great characters, so... I, I always have trouble choosing between the two because they have so dra so many different drastic things working in their favour. Yeah, they're a perfect duo, really. Like you said, mm. they've got differences, but they're also like, they feel like thematically part of the same, you know, universe. And mm. um, again, yeah, the the first one just looks so good as well. Like you know, some of those sequences. Oh, yeah. Um, there's a bit weird, you know, he first meets Rachel and there's like uh, light, you know, in the... Yeah, in, yeah, yeah. Not Deckard's office. Um, I forgot his name now. Tyrell's office, and it's just like, yeah, oh. that's the one. Yeah, so mm. yeah, both really great films. Um, one last. I know I said the last one was the last question, but this is another one that I like asking people just to round it off with. Um, are there any upcoming films that can either be right round the corner or, you know, later down the line that you're particularly looking forward to this year? Yeah, I mean, I feel like the second half of this year is looking really good. Mm. Um, Mission Impossible, I'm really excited for. Mm. Part two, I mean, my God, just do. Um, yeah, I can't wait to see that in um, mm. uh, IMAX again. Uh, Spider Verse two again. I'll yep. absolutely. I think Spider Verse is like maybe my favorite comic book film I've done. So that mm. one's got to be up there. Um, uh, Miyazaki's got a new film coming out this year, so I keep I mean, forgetting if, about that one. If it comes out in the UK, <coughs> then that mm. will be definitely anticipate, highly anticipated. Mm. And I, I always say sometimes the films that I end up loving the most are the ones that I just don't know anything about until yeah. they come out. Um, mm. I mean, last year I remember seeing Quiet Girl, I had no idea about didn't know anything about it, yeah. just walked in, and oh yeah. my god, I love it. Um, so mm. I'm always looking forward to a film I don't know about and will just be like blown away by, and yeah, yeah. I, I like those small little films that just kind of sneak up on you. And I I cannot agree with you more with The Quiet Girl. That was one of my favourite films of last year. And I don't think enough people saw it. Um, but it, it's one of those films where I'd heard a little bit of buzz, but not much. And then when yeah. I saw it, I was like, this <clears throat> is fantastic. This is fantastic, especially yeah. for a, a debut film. Um, so it was lovely talking to you, Matt. Um, let everyone know just roughly where they can find you and uh, what outlets you uh, you can be found through. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm on Twitter, which is uh, at Matty Dudin. Uh, I tend mm. to tweet a lot about films and there's some links to my work on there as well. Mm. Um, my letterbox is Mr. Duds. Um, again, that's also linked on my Twitter. And Yeah, yeah I'm hopefully going to try and write maybe some pieces for other platforms this year we'll sort of see how it goes mm. um but yeah that's where you can find me and in fact yeah thanks for having me on it's been cool. good no worries uh because i was going to say you mostly write for the cinematique don't you at the moment yeah yeah, yeah. um i i mean half the problem is you know like just trying to get those preview screens but i'm, I'm going to a, like a festival um one in manchester in mm. in june july okay. so i'll see some stuff there i could review and cool Again, I know that you can often pitch like non-review pieces, like like lists uh, or like yeah. retrospectives. So I'm hopefully, when I get time, try and do that a bit more this year and you know, okay. widen my um, portfolio, as it were. Um, and yeah. yeah, hopefully see you know, you know get to the festivals as well. So yeah, looking forward to it. Yeah. Anyway, it was lovely speaking to you, Matt. Um, and I look forward to seeing what you're gonna do. Um, with your writing and I, I, I can't wait to see what you uh, write about from those festivals because um, even though it is great writing about London Film Festival it's nice to go to other ones um, and kind of yeah, expand in. Yeah. Um, yeah thanks again for having us on it's been good and look forward to honestly seeing more of these as well like more, mm. um, more podcasts and stuff and yeah mm. seeing yeah. the guests you get on and stuff so I've good. got uh, a couple people in the pipeline, um, but honestly, every every time I post one of these, I will just be 
getting people like if you want to be on it just ask away i this is it's an open door here and i yep. want as many people <laughs> on as possible because i just love having a platform to be able to talk about films with people that are interested in that as well um and it's just nice to keep things varied on this channel as well because for the last eight years it's kind of been the same thing um but uh yeah it, it like i said lovely having you on and i look forward to talking to you more in the future and also seeing what other people we or i get on this series because i genuinely have no idea at the moment <laughs> um <laughs> So yeah, um, yeah, thanks for talking to me, Matt, and I will see everyone else in the next video, whatever that may be. Bye.